Thank you so much. Um, so it's great to be here today. I think this is going to be a really fun conference. Uh, usually when I give update and diabetes talks, I'm just excited. Uh, this one is a little daunting because in the month since I submitted my, quote, final slides, um, as previously alluded to, we've had two new approvals of first-in-class kind of diabetic agents, the first time we've ever had basal insulin GLP combos. That just was a couple of weeks ago. We now have the very first ever available biosimilar insulin. You guys heard about this glargine, biosimilar glargine, so it just hit the pharmacies this week. Um, and most importantly, I think, we now have the first cardiovascular indication for a diabetes drug ever. So in just in the past couple of weeks, yes, we know diabetes drugs lower blood sugar and A1C, but since so many of our diabetics are dying from a heart disease, it's pretty exciting to have an indication now for the drug embucloflocin. Okay, so we'll get into all that in a little more detail. This is just to remind us, as was alluded to earlier, how far we've come just in the last 20 years. Um, up until 1995, we had basically um, insulins and we had sulfonylureas. So metformin, at least in this country, didn't come around until around the mid-1990s, followed thereafter by the TZDs. And for those of you who are younger, you've since known an explosion of different classes of agents. We're up to at least 12 or 13 now distinct classes. All right, so I've highlighted throughout the talk different colors just to keep us oriented. So purple, every time you see purple, these are what we call the older or established diabetes drugs. We won't spend a lot of time on these, but there are a couple of tidbits you should know about them that may be new to you. Um, in the next color scheme, the red drugs are the, quote, newer drugs. These have been around for at least the past 10 years. The SGLT2s have really been around since 2013. So my primary objective for you guys is if you're not already comfortable using these, I'd like you to be a little more comfortable thinking about these drugs before we leave today. They will have a huge place in the management of your diabetic. Insulins, um, we've had human insulins. We've had analog insulins since the 1990s when Lysopro Humalog came along. The two basal insulin analogs, Levomir and Lantus, or Glargine and Detamir, have been around for a while now. So in the past one or two years or so, um, we now have another basal insulin, Degladec. Um, I won't say it's a massive game changer, but it is distinct, different, and may have some advantages for your patients beyond Glargine, so we'll talk about that. And then there's a whole host of concentrated of insulins now. They are not necessarily game changers in the sense that they're not new insulins. You can just get a lot more insulin and a lot less volume for a number of our insulins. And as prescribers, you have to be savvy to understand how to actually dispense these drugs so there are no errors. And then finally, those agents in these little green brackets, that just means I won't be talking about them. They're not huge impact factors. They're just FDA approved for treatment of diabetes. So just so you know they're out there, um, probably not relevant to you so much. All right, how many of you guys have seen this algorithm or a version thereof? Okay, so it's been around for about a year or two now. The newest version was just released yesterday or day before. Um, it's a little bit different, and we'll highlight those as we go along. But in general, the, the American Diabetes, Diabetes Association algorithm supports what I think all of us know, which is that lifestyle is incredibly important, not just for hypertension, but for diabetes. Metformin is the first-line drug for basically every type 2 diabetic. You have to basically think of a reason not to use metformin. If people can tolerate it, it should be used as first line. And then um, the ADA is a little democratic when it comes to second-line agents. I mean, that's my big question. What do I add after metformin? I suspect it's more of an issue even in the primary care population. Um, the agents in purple, as you see, are kind of on equal par with the agents in red, meaning it's kind of up to us, at least according to this algorithm, whether we use the older or newer agents. The ADA pits efficacy, which is the first, if you can see it there, at the top of the column, against all the bad things that can happen with diabetes drugs. Hypoglycemia, weight gain, cost is huge, um, and asks us to consider those factors individually in a patient when we choose a drug. There are different groups out there that more strongly support using newer drugs versus older drugs because of advantages like lack of hypoglycemia and weight loss. So that's a little bit controversial, but I think we're moving towards that direction. Excuse me. And third line was supposed to be, third line there, you can really just add whatever you didn't add from the second line drug. There's a big trial coming out called the GRADE trial, still in process. We're enrolling at UNC also to really try and help us figure out what's the next best drug after metformin in a head-to-head -head trial as opposed to trying to compare across different trials, which is really difficult. Okay, so maybe we'll have some answers in the future. The updated guidelines, if you look at the third-line treatment, 
Um, the only thing that you're really not supposed to add together are DPP4s and GLP-1 receptor agonists, which kind of makes sense. They're both incretin mimetics. That hasn't changed. We do have data for adding the SGLT2s and the GLP-1s, just again out in the past couple of months in the Lancet. It's called the duration trial. You didn't get additive or synergistic effects, but you got more effect, and more importantly, it was safe to do. So the newer version of the guidelines suggest that's also a possible third-line combo using those two newer agents together. Lastly, um, when you get to basal insulin plus bolus insulin, we're really trying to encourage folks not to pull out the four-shot-a-day regimen, particularly for type 2 diabetics. A um, lot of weight gain, hypoglycemia. It's a complex regimen, and we have alternatives now. It is not a bad thing to use, especially for your kind of insulinopenic, quote, burnt out type 2, but it, we really would hope that we would think about things like GLPs when you're trying to get prandial control. All right, so let's spend just a few minutes on the older agents that most of you are familiar with. Um, this slide is very commonly shown. It's the so-called ominous octet, the many different ways that you can get to hyperglycemia. The drugs we've had up until the past 10 years or so concentrated mostly on the beta cells of the pancreas, getting the beta cells to make more insulin, or getting the periphery to listen to that insulin. So what does insulin do? It acts on the muscle, it acts on the fat to get sugar to be taken up into those organs, and it acts on the liver to get that liver to not make so much sugar. Excess glucose production by the liver is a major issue, and that's where metformin comes in. I'll show you this again when we get to the newer agents, and we'll bring in some other target organs, okay? So sulfonylurea is, you think you everyone's very familiar with. I just listed the ones that are available to us. Um, Meglitinides are another insulin secretagogues. They're short acting. They're used at meal times. Does anyone use meglitinides? Yeah, occasionally. I think that's a great answer. That's my answer too. It's nothing you think about first line. It doesn't really even show up in the algorithms. But there are some drugs you should know exist for that select patient who needs a quote kinder, gentler kind of sulfonylurea that you can take at meals. Um, you do need functioning beta cells for these drugs to work. A1C reduction in general is about 1% to 2%. This is hugely variable as it is for every other slide that I show. Okay, this assumes most patients with A1C is about 8%, maybe 9%, not much higher. The higher A1C with any diabetes drug, the greater reduction you'll see in A1C. We've all seen folks who are new diabetics with 13s and 14s who do great with metformin and lifestyle changes. But, so these are kind of estimates for all comers. We know they work physiologically, so you get insulin delivery not just peripherally, but through the portal vein. Um, you get response pretty quickly. You know right away if it's going to work or not, and they're incredibly cheap. Um, generally $4 or less at many retailers. Sometimes they'll give them to you for free. My local Kroger will give it to you for free if you go and get your other medications there. Um, hypoglycemia is the major risk. Um, there is some differential among agents. Glyburide hang around, hangs around the longest, so if any of you have admitted patients with sulfonylurea overdose, it's a, it can take a couple of days for this to get out of your system, and they'll be on a D5 or D10 drip. So if you have elderly patients, folks with CKD, we really try to encourage not using sulfonylureas or using very low doses. You're going to get most of your effect of your sulfonylurea at half maximal dose, so 10 of glipizide, 4 of glimepiride. There's not much reason to push higher other than patient resistance and maybe lack of money to do anything else. Um, you just get more hypoglycemia and weight gain. And then um, in terms of Mealtime dosing, you can do that, as we said, with the meglitinides. Sometimes people just have a postprandial surge at one meal. Um, I won't say much about the adverse cardiovascular effect. That's been an ongoing conversation since the early 90s with UKPDS. Um, with certain classes of uh, cell phone areas that are not widely used in the US, perhaps there's a differential effect on the myocardium, particularly in the post-MI situation. I wouldn't consider these adverse effect drugs. I would just say there are other drugs that are better for the heart. All right, metformin, not much to say here. Just remember, it is a liver sensitizer, so that morning glucose, that pre-meal glucose, tends to respond a lot better than the postprandial glucose. Um, it decreases A1C anywhere from 1% to 2% in general. We all know the benefits. Um, the cons. So I would hope that most of you can get most of your folks on metformin. You know, a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to take it. My relative had bad GI side effects. You know, certainly don't discount your patient's concerns. But most studies have shown you should be able to get at least 90 to 95% of folks on a reasonable dose of metformin, um, which is anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day, though most of us do push it higher than that. Um, are many of you giving B12 to your patients who take metformin? 
Yeah, so about a third of folks who take long-term metformin can develop B12 deficiency. Now, how many of those go on to develop clinically significant issues like neuropathy, anemia, is not as well established. There's almost no downside to doing it. Um, you can certainly measure B12 levels. Our hematologist friends will tell us that's not the best measure of B12 sufficiency. There's a lot of issues with B12 measurement. So in general, for long-term users, those who have neuropathy, those who have anemia, I don't think it's a bad idea to just supplement. And then lactic acidosis gets a lot of press. You know, over the years, we've been cautious. Creatinines of 1.5 in women, 1.6 in men were thought to be cutoffs. Um, it's a really rare complication of metformin use. And it's such a good drug that in, I think, April of this year, the FDA updated its guidelines for metformin use. Um, so EGFRs under 30 still considered contraindicated. EGFRs 30 to 45. Um, you can still use metformin, and the FDA is okay with that. I think most of us have used lower doses anyway. Um, if someone is not on the drug yet, you may not want to start it for the first time when their EGFR is 32. But if folks have been taking it, have been doing well, there's no reason to yank it off if they're clinically stable. The benefits of it probably outweigh the risks in that case. Um, so just remember that. TZDs. So these have really fallen off the radar for a lot of folks, although you know, the first one came out when I was in medical school, so I feel like I kind of grew up with TZDs. Um, pioglitazone and rosaglitazone, these are also insulin sensitizers mainly in the periphery. So they actually help differentiation of fat into, quote, good fat is probably the simplest way to think about it. Um, they do preserve beta cell production, um, function, rather in human trials as well as animal trials. So early on, before we had other agents, this was considered a pretty exciting um, drug in the terms of delaying onset of progression to worse diabetes or to diabetes. A1C reduction is a little bit less than for the first couple of agents we discussed, but still pretty good, well over 1%. The big issue with these that was good when they came out was they don't cause hyperglycemia when used with metformin. Um, and that was um, pretty exciting at the time. They are now available in a generic. If you've ever tried to tell your patients that, it's not the cheap generic. So for folks who are really bad off, it's not a $4 drug. Um, $30 and $40 may not be much to some of us, but I think it's still a lot for a lot of our patients. Pioglitazone is associated with favorable liver, lipid effects, lower triglycerides, higher HDL, so the numbers look pretty. And in terms of actual outcomes, there are at least three good um, Actos or pioglitazone trials showing improvements in some hard cardiovascular outcome including the IRIS trial that just came out in New England Journal this year, showing that if you, if you weren't diabetic, if you just had insulin resistance and you were given this pioglitazone drug, you had less chance of having a second stroke after the first TIA or stroke. So it's pretty, I think, convincing. So why isn't everyone on it? Well, I think all of you know. This bulleted list just keeps growing, unfortunately. Um, I wouldn't say this is a huge issue for every patient who takes a TZD. Um, unfortunately, though, most of these are real. We do know about edema, weight gain, and CHF. That is not new. We've known about that forever. We've handled it. We've counseled our patients to cut back on their salt, take your thiazide. We don't give it to folks with CHF um, because they can get worse CHF. But then the other issues is what really kind of killed the deal for rosiglitazone, um, the 2008 or 2006 meta-analysis showing higher cardiovascular events. Um, got it pulled from a number of countries, restricted use in the US. Even though data since then has shown that perhaps it's really not quite as risky, there's just so much murky water out there, it's not coming back, in my opinion. Bladder cancer risk, I don't know if you guys have been counseling patients about this or people ask you about this. It showed up, interestingly enough, in a Kaiser Permanente big database study a couple of years ago for with pioglitazone. If you were on high doses of it for longer duration, you had more of a risk. Again, not a large percent, but just increased statistically compared to folks who took other drugs. That has been reconfirmed this year by another reanalysis. So it is not a big occurrence. It is just probably a real occurrence. Probably older folks, smokers, people on long-term actose therapy you need to think about and probably not prescribe it. Um, have you heard of this fracture risk with pioglitazone? This is actually real. I mean, it shows up in clinical trials. The signal is there across the board. Again, not a large number of folks, women, postmenopausal women, and we're not talking standard osteoporotic fractures. These are kind of long bone fractures, weird ones like humerus fractures. It does decrease BMD. We don't know if it's because, you know, as you're differentiating fat into good fat, are you differentiating those mesenchymal stem cells away from bone? Um, so there's a lot of interesting lab data on this. In real life, most people who take these drugs aren't fracturing, but just think about it and maybe don't use it in your older, thin, postmenopausal female who has low bone density. And it takes a while to work. These don't work right away. They take weeks, 
up to six weeks to get full action, if not more. So I thought about not even including the slide because alpha glucosidase inhibitors aren't even on the algorithms, um, but you may see them in another setting, so I thought I'd throw this out there. So these have been around for a while. They work pretty simply. They just delay carbohydrate absorption from the gut. Remember, alpha glucosidase is just that enzyme that helps you absorb carbohydrates from the gut. Um, so it can help with your postprandial glucose. They are taken at meals. They're kind of a nice option for your heavy carb eaters. Certain ethnic groups tend to be rice eaters, pasta eaters, and they might just have a little excursion once during the day, but they're not incredibly effective. Um, they are available in a generic form now. The reason I included it is that um, third bullet, we are having more and more folks in this country get gastric bypass with good reason. Um, about two years after gastric bypass, there's a higher incidence of post-bypass hypoglycemia. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but in an endocrine population, this is a large part of our referrals. They just have a very insulin robust response to their um, meals. So sometimes we use this drug off-label to curb that dumping, not dumping, that glucose rise that's followed by an insulin rise. So if you don't want to remember that, you don't have to, but just know that we are still using it for other reasons. And then the cons are that you get flatulence. You know, anything that inhibits absorption, you get gas. Nobody likes that. There is some incidence of liver enzyme elevation, and you do have to dose it with meals. So I don't think it's going to be a major part of your armamentarium, but you know it's there. Okay. So let's move on to what I really want to talk about today, the um, newer agents that are available. This is the same ominous octet I showed you before, but I have different organs circled. Okay, so now we have the gut really coming into play, um, the brain, the kidneys, that's with the newest agent, the SGLT2 inhibitors, and then the pancreas, not only are we targeting beta cells, we're now targeting alpha cells in the last 10 years with Anchorton mimetics. So this is kind of exciting because these were different mechanisms of hyperglycemia that were wholly unaddressed by previous agents. All right, so if you guys still have your bookmarked page for Poll Everywhere, refresh it. Um, hopefully you can answer one of the only two questions I have, uh, which is what do the GLP receptor agonists and DPP4 inhibitors have in common? Hopefully you can see that. Which of these things is true? Great, that's a really nice response, actually. Um, so I will just say that I think answer C was most frequently picked, and that is correct. Neither one of these drugs causes significant hypoglycemia when used as monotherapy, and I'll go on to say even when used with metformin, okay? So that's true of all the incretimimetics. Um, the first, second, and third statements there are probably true for the GLP receptor agonists. They are not necessarily true for the DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, the GFR indication is typically for exenatide, either sh short or long acting. Mm -hmm. There is a restriction on that use in the label. Okay? So, good job. All right, so we've been hearing about incretins for some time now. These aren't as new as we think. You know, we've known about the existence of incretins since the 70s and 80s. They're just gut derived peptide hormones. So, the endocrine system is the most awesome system out there because it is in every organ, including the gut. Um, the two we talk about the most are GLP, um, which has been manipulated pharmacologically, and GIP, which is actually, I think, a more interesting one, but it has not really been manipulated pharmacologically, so we won't talk too much about that. Um, they're secreted by the small intestine and, in some cases, parts of the colon. Not just glucose, but any nutrient intake causes these hormones to go up in normal individuals. Um, and unfortunately, in type 2 diabetics, um, secretion of incretins is markedly abnormal, and that contributes to at least 30 to 40 percent of the impaired insulin response in type 2 diabetics. So simply put, the quote, incretin effect is the fact that you get a greater insulin response when you give oral glucose to a person than when you give that same amount of glucose IV. This is a normal person. That's what an incretin effect is. Okay, so this graph gets shown a lot too, but it's a pretty simple way to explain that whole incretin effect. Um, you see what happens when you give IV glucose to a healthy subject, their insulin goes up and the glucose comes back to normal. Great. But if you give that same amount of glucose orally, the insulin not only goes up, it goes up faster and it reaches a higher peak. So there's something about nutrient getting delivered to the gut that really primes your pancreas and primes other things to bring the insulin and the glucose down quickly. 
Um, and that is what's termed the incretin effect because it's probably due to gut incretins. Diabetic patients have markedly different curves. The yellow curve, you know, if you give a diabetic IV insulin, certainly their insulin, I mean, IV glucose, their insulin will go up, and interestingly, more so, it's just lags. But if you give oral glucose, you see that orange curve is very low. The diabetic patient does not secrete insulin in a robust or rapid manner to oral glucose or oral in nutrient intake. Here's a closer look at the physiologic functions of your endogenous gut GLP-1. Um, let's start with the beta cell. So what's so exciting about stimulating insulin secretion? We already have sulfonylureas. Um, well, what's exciting about this is it's glucose, in, um, glucose dependent. So the sulfonylurea doesn't know when to start to shut off and leave that potassium channel alone in the, in the beta cell. Um, when glucose levels fall, to around 70, 80, or below, the action of incretin or the action of GLP-1 slows down and stops. So that's why we don't really have a lot high incidence of hyperglycemia with these drugs. Then the alpha cell. So remember, alpha cells are also part of those pancreatic islets, and they make glucagon. Um, we use glucagon pharmacologically in kits when people have severe hypoglycemia, typically insulin-induced. It raises sugar really quickly. But if you're a diabetic sitting there with chronic hyperglucagonemia and no one's doing anything about it, that's a problem. So GLP does actually inhibit glucagon secretion from the pancreas. In the central nervous system, um, you hit some of those satiety centers in the hypothalamus. There's a lot of them. This is a very complex subject, but it does promote satiety, and it slows gastric emptying. So you don't want food hitting the bloodstream quickly if you don't want if, to uh, um, avoid glucose going up. So if you keep those four actions in mind, it's very easy to understand how these drugs work. They're just agonists um, or analogs of your native GLP. Exenatide was the first one in our country around 2006, followed by liraglutide in around 2010, I believe. Um, and then the weekly ones have come out since then, including albaglutide, dualglutide. Lixazenatide is not one of our drugs in the US. It's used elsewhere. It was recently improved as a combination drug with glargine. That's the new approval I told you about um, about three, four weeks ago. So you'll be hearing more about lixazenatide. So it basically just stimulates those same receptors. The difference between that and your native GLP is that GLP receptor agonists don't get degraded. Um, so they're designed so that they're resistant to degradation, so they last a long time, and they're super physiologic. You get really high levels of GLP in the bloodstream when you use these drugs. Um, they decrease your A1C pretty well, at least a point, percentage point, maybe more. I don't know about you guys, but in clinical practice and folks who respond really well to these drugs, I see more significant A1C reduction, but it is variable. Not everyone's going to get the same amount. So big pros, you can already guess, low hypoglycemia. Weight loss listed there doesn't seem that impressive, but just remember, up until recently, everything caused weight gain. So one to three kilos of weight loss while the A1C is coming down, we've all had cases where people do much better than this. Um, it just depends on the patient. Um, do they preserve beta cell function? We have animal studies. We have early human studies. That is not ready for prime time, but that's the hope that they might if they're used earlier. And then I probably need to take away this question mark since the FDA just allowed empagliflozin to be um, labeled for cardiovascular risk reduction. I have a slide after this that goes over all those trials, okay? Um, so the, oh, actually, I'm sorry, that was for SGL2. This one has not been approved yet specifically for CV events, these class of agents. But the leader trial was presented a couple of months ago in Europe. Um, our group was a study site for the leader trial. And I, there's a typo there. It's not albaglutide, it's semaglutide in the sustained trial. But again, my next slide has everything written out a little more clearer. And then lixazenatide, although it did not improve CV events in a trial, was, uh, was neutral. And that was kind of the whole point of some of these trials. You know, after the roziglitazone scare, FDA has since required diabetic drugs, at least after initial approval, prove that they're not going to kill you. Um, and so this is the impetus for all these cardiovascular outcome trials. So neutral is still good but positive is better. Nausea is the biggest con. So if you guys had patients stop taking these drugs, if you've ever used them for nausea, emesis, yeah. So it's, it is uh, something you have to counsel patients about. You don't want patients feeling like stink all the time and vomiting, and most of these patients are not. Most people can tolerate these drugs that are titrated appropriately. But it's the number one reason why people stop them in clinical trials, and it's variable from drug to drug. So I'll show you a comparator trial. 
Um, what about pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer? It's sitting there when you get the printout of all the bad things this drug can do to you. Um, it was not in the initial clinical trials. It was in post-marketing reports. You know, of course, there's always a concern if 100 cases are reported, are there really 4,000 cases out there? Um, but interestingly, in the newer trials, like all these huge cardiovascular outcome trials, there was no increased risk of pancreatitis in the active drug group. And in fact, there was less pancreatitis in some of these trials. Um, it's really hard to talk about pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer and diabetes because being diabetic is a big risk factor for getting pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. So again, when I speak to my patients, I try not to blow anything off because I've been burned before, but I say, unless you're someone with triglycerides of 5,000 or someone who's had pancreatitis or an alcoholic or gallstones sitting there you know, waiting to come down the bile duct, I'm okay with, you know, with using them. Just let me know if you have severe side effects. Same thing about C-cell tumors and rodents. It's not, to my knowledge, applicable in humans at this point, but it's on the label. C-cells are those cells in the thyroid that secrete calcitonin. If they become cancerous, you get this rare kind of cancer called medullary thyroid cancer. Again, seen with very high doses in rodents, not yet seen in humans. So there's no indication to go around you know, doing thyroid ultrasounds in your patients to screen for nodules, so please don't do that. Um, injections, so that used to be a big barrier in my practice. People don't want to go on injections. I'll tell you, I mean, maybe it's because I have a referral practice. Um, people aren't that upset about injections anymore. They don't love it. They don't ask for an injection. But if you're going to give them a once-weekly drug, and if you can't really even see the needle, and if they're going to lose weight and their sugar's going to come down, I haven't had as much resistance as I used to. So I think some of this is the way we explain this to our patient. Um, and they are expensive. That, by far, is my biggest barrier to use. These are expensive drugs. Um, if any of you folks take care of a lot of Medicare patients, you know, around November, we start getting desperation calls about the donut hole, the coverage gap, these drugs that work great for me. I can't use them for the next two months. We don't do samples at UNC. So it's, it's really a, a logistic issue for folks. All right, cardiovascular outcome trials. I mentioned the Elixir trial with lixazenatide, um, and then the other two are listed there as well. The nice thing for those of us who get kind of blurry dyed with tables is they all have the same primary endpoint. It was a composite endpoint of MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, so they said cardiovascular death, MI or stroke, even if you didn't die from it, all that combined is the primary endpoint they're looking at, which seems like a very reasonable primary endpoint. So with lixazenatide, it was kind of a neutral study. So that's good. You breathed a sigh of relief. Um, but then along came LEADER, which showed a 13% reduction in risk for the primary endpoint, and if you break it down further, a lot of this was driven by the reduction in cardiovascular death, which is an important endpoint. MI and stroke didn't reach statistical significance on their own, but they went in the right direction. So it wasn't one of those things where, yeah, you died less, but if you lived, you ended up with more stroke and heart attack, which could be concerning. Um, in terms of sustained semaglutide, which is not yet available in the US, that was a really short trial. If you look down at the footnotes, it was only about two years. It was a smaller trial, only about 3,000 patients, and it too showed a nice reduction in the primary composite endpoint, driven in this case primarily by a reduction in stroke. So lots of people spend a lot of time breaking this down. What does this really mean? I think the big take home for all of us is that we have drugs in the GLP category that don't raise your CV risk. We have a couple of drugs that in large trials reduce at least some of those clinically relevant endpoints. And there's more coming down the line. The exenatide trial with CV outcome is going to be coming out in the next couple of years. So we will start to have drug-specific data, not just class data. All right, on a more practical level, how do these drugs size up? How, do they, how much do they reduce your A1C, help you lose weight, et cetera? So we tend to um, divide them into shorter-acting and longer-acting drugs, shorter-acting meaning they are around for less than 24 hours. So for any of you guys who used exenatide when it first came out, and it's still available, it's a twice-daily drug. You can either use five twice a day or 10 micrograms twice a day. They each come in their own pen. You're supposed to take it before your first and maybe second or third meal of the day. Um, Lixazenatide, I didn't put any pluses in there just because we don't really have it in this country to use, but it's not that um, different from exenatide. Um, I will say, if you'll look down at the caveat to this table, this A1C reduction, these are not all direct head-to-head -head trials, right? But we do have head-to-head -head data from some of these GLPs, and then we have some that are non-head-to-head, -head, and I just kind of put it together for you. So the longer-acting agents do tend to lower your fasting glucose more than your shorter-acting agents. I still think exenatide BID is one of the best ways to get that postprandial down. You see some pretty impressive decreases. It doesn't translate into greater A1C reduction, though. 
The ones listed in the, um, or shown in the red squares are probably the most efficacious. So if you say, I just want the best A1C lowering GLP for my patient, you probably want to pick one of these three, if that's your only consideration for that patient. Um, of course, there are other considerations, like weight loss. Um, these are not weight loss drugs, at least not in this form. Um, liraglutide, which is Victoza, is approved at a higher dose under a different name called Saxenda for weight loss. I'm not talking about that today. So don't tell your patients they're weight loss drugs, but they are diabetic drugs with good weight profile is the way we put it. Um, most people do what, lose weight, liraglutide, um, extended exenatide, and dulaglutide again, probably win there. In terms of GI side effects, of course, some of the more efficacious drugs are also some of the ones that in clinical trials more people left. So liraglutide tends to be the one that has the greatest effect in terms of nausea and GI side effect, but it's also very titratable. You know, there's a bunch of doses that come in one pen. You don't have to use maximum dose to get glycemic effect. And then site reactions. Um, has anyone used the exenatide once weekly? The bidurian. So if you've seen patients come in with these little subcutaneous nodules, yeah, they're not pretty. I was surprised when I first started using it. It's not insignificant. Um, it's not medically dangerous. The drug still works, but it's very uncomfortable for the patient. This table lists albaglutide doing the same thing. I personally haven't had that experience with albaglutide, but I don't use it as much because it's not quite as strong an agent. A lot of times, my choice is dictated by what the insurance will cover, which is kind of sad, but that's just the way life is. Um, so you do what you have to, and just know that you're not doing anything bad. All these drugs work pretty well, okay? And then if you get a bad side effect or they don't work, you can appeal for the next agent in class based on your preference. So if I have a patient who is, um, well, I'll go on and do it in the next slide. I think I have a comparator. Um, footnotes there say that A1C reduction is as monotherapy or when added to one of these other agents or when added to insulin. They've been studied up and down with everything. So you can feel comfortable using these drugs in combination therapy. Number two is important. Weight loss is greater when GLPs are added to metformin than when added to sulfonylureas. So can you use them with sulfonylureas? Yes. Um, but just know that you may mitigate some of that weight loss effect if you're doing that. And then we mentioned the CKD issue. Exenatide is not supposed to be used with creatinines under or EGFRs under 30. So this is kind of an outlier slide, but it's a question that comes up often, particularly for those of you who are kind of using the paradigm of metformin sulfonylurea. Um, sometimes basal insulin is the third agent to go to, and that's certainly not wrong. It's a streamlined, easy regimen. Um, would you use potentially a GLPRA in that setting as the, quote, third agent? The argument is that they're better or equal at A1C lowering, particularly if A1C is under 10%. And of course, you'll get less hypoglycemia and some weight loss rather than weight gain, potentially. Um, but there are reasons to still consider basal insulins. There is nothing better for getting a very high A1C down in a symptomatic patient than insulin. So A1C is over 10, blood sugars in the 300s, C patients who have catabolic looking picture, they're losing weight. There's no reason not to use insulin. It's an excellent drug. Um, concern for autoimmune diabetes. So if you guys diagnose type 1 diabetes in older folks, a couple, yeah, so about 10% of people who have type 2 diabetes is diagnosed as an adult really have type 1 diabetes. It's a more insidious onset in older folks. When we're adults, we don't all of a sudden come in with fluorid decay, you know, two weeks into beta cell loss like a child would. We see tons of it. I diag I've diagnosed 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds. These are folks who flounder on metformin. They keep trying to lose weight because you tell them to, um, and they come in with very high A1Cs. So if someone is a little atypical, they didn't get diabetes until they were 50, maybe they're not so heavy, they have no family history, they have fasting hyperglycemia, um, you may want to think about checking C-peptide levels and insulin autoantibodies um, because they will have a little bit of insulin production left, but not much. Um, so those folks clearly need insulin. Um, if you have people with severe GI side effects, history of pancreatitis, et cetera, obviously insulin's probably a better choice. Um, I won't say much about fasting hyperglycemia. Dollar signs apply to everything. Unfortunately, even analog insulins, which have been around forever, just keep going up and up and up. Um, but there are some cheaper insulins out there, namely the human insulins, and ones from certain retailers can be a little bit cheaper out of pocket, which is not the case for GLPs. So four practicalities I want to discuss. One is choosing an agent. Um, as I said, if your formulary dictates it, go for that. If your formulary doesn't dictate it, decide what's more important to you. Is it A1C reduction? Is it nausea risk? And there may be a little difference between those groups. Needle phobia is important. So if you have a patient who's terrified of needles, you probably don't want to do BID exenatide. You may not even want to do once daily liraglutide. You may want to reach for a weekly agent like dulaglutide or longer exenatide. 
It's re I don't know if you guys have ever injected yourself with these things. I have demo pens. I often do it all before the patient does because I'm curious. Um, you really can't see the needle for some of this. It's pretty um, impressive. It's, I tell patients it's easier than checking your blood sugar, and I'm not lying, to be honest, for some of these drugs. Um, discuss expectations. This is really important. I know we're all time pressured. Um, you can, if you have the luxury of a nurse or a clinical pharmacist who can do this, I encourage you to use it. Compliance is much greater if you're able to pre-counsel patients about things. Nausea is usually transient. You tell people it goes away within two to eight weeks. Um, if it's a little bit of nausea, like you know, morning sickness or just like you ate too much Thanksgiving food, just get through it. It'll go away. Respect sense of fullness. So being hungry is an awful feeling, and a lot of our patients who are overweight and diabetic are hungry a lot. They have never experienced fullness. And so when you get a drug on board for the first time, they're actually full when they're eating normal portions. Respect that. Don't automatically scarf down the food or go for your next meal because you're going to get sick. Um, decrease fat in the diet. Keep a log of foods that cause nausea. Many of my patients, it's only certain meals that cause it. Well, just stay away from those meals when you're on these drugs. And of course, severe GI symptoms have to be reported if the drug stopped and potentially amylase and lipase checked if you have severe vomiting, nausea, or abdominal pain. So you probably need to adjust any agents that are hypoglycemia-inducing agents if you're starting out, particularly with a relatively good A1C under 8, even 8.5. Sometimes I will reduce the sulfonylurea dose or stop the sulfonylurea when I start a GLP. Um, you may want to also do the same thing with your insulins. Good rule of thumb, at least 20% reduction of the insulin. I usually start with reducing the prandial insulin first. If it's someone who was on a complex regimen and you're trying to get them off that mealtime insulin, start taking off that mealtime insulin first. The GLP will often do the job if it's someone who still has endogenous insulin production. Um, but it's a little bit of trial and error. And then titrate slowly. Um, these are not drugs that you necessarily have to ramp up to full dose. I even tell folks, look, if you don't get any blood sugar response or weight response in the first few weeks, I don't care. I just want to make sure you can take the drug. Um, and so that resets their expectations so they're not frustrated with this incredibly expensive drug that's not causing them to lose, you know, 50 pounds in the first month. And those are just some numbers there for you. Most of these drugs come in all sorts of different pen doses. You have to start with the lowest pen, then switch. Liraglutide, it's all in one pen. All right, so that was the um, one class of incretin inhibitors, the GLP agonists, and we'll move now to the DPP-4 inhibitors. So those are the ones available in our country. Um, there are about 11 different DPP-4s available worldwide, but these are the ones that are in our formularies. And they're pretty simple as well. DPP-4 um, is the natural enzyme that breaks down your natural GLP. So if you inhibit the inhibitor, um, then you end up with more of your native GLP hanging around. Um, so we don't get super physiologic levels of GLP. You know, it's not like you're injecting GLP agonist, but you do get um, sustained physiologic levels. So your own native GLP stays around longer with these drugs. So this A1C reduction, if you notice, in comparison to the GLP agonist, is more modest. We're not getting up to 1.5 or close to 2% like we did in some GLP trials. We're getting generally 1%, often um, less, but we are still getting significant A1C reduction. The big pro to this drug, in my mind, is it's easy. Um, there's no hypoglycemia. You're not going to gain weight. Again, no hypoglycemia on its own or with metformin. Um, it's once daily. It's a pill. Um, the only side effects really reported, the major ones in trials, were things like some nasopharyngitis, headache. You know, so for your patient who just has side effects with everything, this is probably not a bad drug to try. Um, you can use it in CKD, which is kind of cool, because especially in my population, CKD is a big issue. Um, so for me, there's a lot of cons for this drug, the main one being it's modest in A1C lowering. So again, I have a referral practice. So by the time folks come to me, they've had their diabetes for a long time. They've tried everything. I'm not going to probably add these drugs, but my primary care colleagues tell me they actually get good, pretty good benefit out of them. Um, what do you guys think? Are you using these drugs with metformin? Yeah. So I mean, they're easy to use. They're good drugs. They work. And I, I suspect if you use them early in the course of someone's diabetes, they probably work a lot better than if you used it later in the course. Um, although you can use it as adjunctive drug therapy. You can probably get insulin needs down if you use it. But this is a good drug for someone who's been on metformin. Maybe they're hanging out with a high sevens, eights, um, and they just need another drug and they can afford it. Um, same issue of pancreatitis, pancreatic cancer as with the GLPs. There's not a signal in clinical trials. Um, there's been post-marketing reports. Um, the newer studies don't show that either, but it is still on the label. 
CHF, that's one we should talk about. We didn't talk about it for GLP agonists. So for saxagliptin and allagliptin, there are now warnings, I believe, um, that FDA has issued, I think, in the last year or so. The data has been there for a while. So you know, all these cardiovascular outcome trials we're trying to do. So these have been done in the past couple of years, things like TICOS, SAVER to me, all those wonderful you know, names that cardiologists come up with. They um, have not shown any cardiovascular risk like heart attack, stroke, death, which was the main reason those trials were done. But there was a heart failure signal, more heart failure, more heart failure hospitalization, at least compared to folks who were taking placebo. Um, so that's on there. I don't really understand the mechanism of that, and I don't see it clinically, but again, I'm not using a lot of these drugs. But thankfully, they're otherwise cardiovascularly neutral, um, and they are very expensive as well. So this table is a little less busy than the GLP table. Um, how do you compare the DPP-4 inhibitors? Um, basically, efficacy is about the same. I don't really find one to be more or less efficacious. You don't have to adjust Trojenta or Linagliptin at all for CKD. Um, you can just give it to the patient. I've even used it in dialysis patients. Um, the others probably do need to be adjusted depending on the degree of CKD. And then the warning for CHF, as I mentioned, is on two of the agents. Um, so probably you wouldn't pick those in folks with you know, severe CHF or clinical CHF. Um, the footnote just says, with one of the agents, I believe it's saxagliptin, we should be reducing the dose to the lower dose if you're using it with a CYP inhibitor. So azoles are the big ones, I think, in primary care. If you have a patient on azole therapy, if you have an HIV patient on a protease inhibitor, um, it can be some interaction there. All right, so any big questions about incretin therapies before we move on? Okay. All right, so if you don't mind answering my second Poll everywhere question, what is the most common side effect of SGLT2 inhibitor therapy? I'm only seeing one bar. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever put it in the second bar. All right. I won't belabor it. I appreciate those of you who are chiming in. Um, and in fact, Choices A, C, and D, or 1, 3, and 4, are certainly not wrong. Those are potential links that have been, potential side effects that have been linked at least with some of the SGLT2s. But in terms of the most common that's present across the class, um, it is the one you guys picked, GU infections, namely UTIs and yeast infections. Um, generally around 10% in clinical trials, but again variable. Women more so than men for reasons you can imagine. Um, most uncomplicated UTIs, not many that were ascending or severe, but just know that that is something you have to counsel patients about. The acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, and this entity called euglycemic DKA, which we should understand, does apply at least to some of the agents, and we'll talk about those. All right, so here's the endocrinologist's view of the kidney, a very simple cartoon nephron there. Um, so if you remember the way glucose is handled in the kidney, you know, we filter all the glucose in our blood through our kidney every day. If you're normal, your proximal tubule there will absorb, reabsorb most of that glucose. 90% or plus is reabsorbed. So that's the sodium glucose transporter type 2, SGLT2. That's the transporter that brings your sugar back into the bloodstream. Certainly, if you're diabetic and your sugars are running 300, why in the world do you want to reabsorb 90% of that back into your bloodstream? And that's where these drugs come in. If you have an SGLT2 inhibitor on board, you no longer get that reabsorption. Um, and then glucose just kind of goes down the nephron and is excreted in the urine. You get glucosuria, which for some of us in the diabetes world, that seems weird. You know, we don't normally like glucosuria, but in fact, it's okay. These drugs are not harming the kidney, and in fact, for the most part. Um, and the glucosuria is the mechanism by which they work. It's a really simple mechanism, but it works. Oh, and I will say, you see the SGLT1 there? There is a drug coming down the pipeline that's a dual SGLT2, TL, SGLT1 inhibitor, so just look for that in the future. All right, so it's a pretty short list of drugs. Right now we have canagliflozin or Invocana, which has been, it's been around since about 2013, though in trials for much longer. Dapagliflozin in 2014, and then empagliflozin shortly thereafter. Um, they decrease A1C not quite as much as the a GLP receptor agonist, because that's the question I get most. If I'm going to use one of these newer drugs, should I use an injectable that gives me more A1C reduction and gives me some nausea? 
Should I use an oral drug that doesn't give me quite as much A1C reduction but gives me weight loss? Um, and there's, there's no one answer for all. But do know the A1C reduction, although it looks somewhat modest, and it's pretty modest across trials compared to the other drugs we talked about, it's real, they work, um, and you can get more than this for select patients. You can get weight loss as well. and that's an, You can imagine if you're um, urinating glucose, you're urinating calories. So people do lose weight. I've seen really impressive weight loss. And in fact, um, in the little bits of head-to-head -head data we have, it may actually be slightly more for this than for some of the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, but I would just say to know that they cause weight loss. They lower blood pressure. This is new compared to GLP receptor agonists. Kind of makes sense, right, because you're getting rid of glucose. You can't pee out pure glucose, so water goes with it. Um, so you do get more systolic reduction than diastolic reduction. Um, this is where I mistakenly said earlier, but here is where I should have taken out the question mark. Um, because in recent weeks, empagliflozin has now a label indication for reduction of cardiovascular events. The next slide I show you will give you the data for that. Um, there is evidence in clinical trials that, thankfully, it slows the progression of diabetic nephropathy, meaning progression of microalbuminuria, which is true for pretty much any diabetic agent, at least from trials in the 1990s and so forth. We already know this for insulin and other intensive therapies. We already mentioned the major decon of GU infection. Orthostasis is important. Okay, so select your patients carefully. If you have an elderly patient, someone who's dizzy, someone who's falling, if you have people like Dr. Basil mentioned who are on four or five drugs for their blood pressure, this can be a problem. You have to let them know that their blood pressure can drop, they can feel dizzy. We don't want our older patients falling or any of our patients falling. There have been reports of acute kidney injury with canagliflozin and dapagliflozin, so the FDA has revised those label warnings. Um, it's possible because, you know, folks may get slightly dehydrated or volume depleted, and therefore they get less delivery to the nephron. Diabetic ketoacidosis has been reported, um, particularly with canagliflozin, probably because it's been around the longest. We're not supposed to get diabetic ketoacidosis in type 2 patients. I think all of you know we do sometimes see DKA in type 2 patients, particularly certain ethnic groups. Um, that resolves when they come out of the hospital and their sugar gets better, the beta cells start functioning again, and they don't need long-term insulin. But with these drugs, the concern is you may be masking DKA because the blood sugars are so low from the renal excretion. So even if you're a patient who has very little insulin reserve, such that you're breaking down your fat and making ketone bodies and showing up a little bit nauseous with a high anion gap, your glucose might only be like 200, 180, 290, that is not what we're used to seeing in DKA. So you, we may miss DKA in these patients. So who do you need to worry about? Not every single type 2 patient, but especially your folks who you're lowering their insulin as you're putting their SGLT2 on board, um, anyone who doesn't look 100% like a type 2 patient. But I tell any of my folks, if you have nausea, abdominal pain, just feel really badly after starting these drugs, you know, let me know. You may need to check anion gap in a BMP, even in someone who doesn't have that high a blood sugar. Bladder cancer risk is a little bit of a signal with dapagliflozin. I don't think it's that strong, but more data to come. And fracture comes up again, this time with canagliflozin. This one probably is, I think, statistically real. You know, there is lower BMD in one study with canagliflozin. We don't know the mechanism. I don't know if it's because bone, you know, minerals are being excreted. Again, more to come with that. So here's the one trial of CV outcomes we have for the SGLT2 inhibitors. More are coming. Um, but the one that was completed and presented in Europe last year was the EMPA-REG trial. This generated a lot of enthusiasm. Um, a lot of patients, multiple sites around the world. Um, these are high-risk patients. They already had cardiovascular disease, um, and they were given either 10 or 25 of empagliflozin or placebo. The trial ran for three years, and that major cardiovascular endpoint was reduced by 14%, driven mainly by that first outcome, CV death. 38% relative risk reduction of CV death, um, which in turn was probably driven a lot by the hospitalization for heart failure. So huge decrease in heart failure risk. Um, and mortality was reduced with a very um, pleasant looking number needed to treat for death. One needed to be treated to prevent 38 deaths. Okay? So again, remember these are high risk patients. This is not applicable to the 25-year-old you know, type 2 diabetic, but the people who are enrolled in this trial. Um, I think what a lot of people found interesting or exciting about the trial one was it didn't matter which dose you used. The 10 and the 25 milligram dose did the same thing in regards to cardiovascular outcomes. And the thing that I found interesting was the curve separated really quickly. You know, at three months, you are already seeing less outcome 
in folks who are taking empagliflozin versus placebo. And that three-month separation was just sustained over three years. So the big question was, why? Why is this happening? Clearly, it's not because the blood sugars are going down. That would take years to have an effect. Um, is it a blood pressure issue? Is it a hemodynamics issue? Probably. Um, I don't know exactly what the mechanism is. Um, in any case, it's fairly exciting. <clears throat> All right, and then comparing the, these drugs, I would say in terms of A1C efficacy, perhaps canagliflozin, particularly at the higher doses, may be a slightly more efficacious, but we're talking like decimal points here. So I would consider them equally efficacious. You do have to adjust for CKD. Okay, so it's not just that perhaps patients with CKD will go on to develop more advanced CKD if you're using these drugs, but the efficacy is not that good for folks who have low, remember we're talking about renal excretion of glucose. So dapagliflozin in particular is very restrictive. Supposedly contraindicated with EGFRs of 60 or below. That's a lot of my patients. Um, but the other two can go down to as much as 45. And then a couple of you guys had at least keyed in the hyperkalemia risk. It's been shown for some canagliflozin patients, um, as well as the other things I've listed there. So at first glance, you know, you kind of know which agent looks the best right now out of those three. But in terms of efficacy, they all pretty, they do well. Um, with future data, we'll see how the other two do against empagliflozin. So choosing an agent is not that difficult in my mind. Um, pick what they allow you to pick, or if they allow you to pick anything, I'd probably pick empagliflozin at this time point. If someone has a severe fracture risk history, bladder cancer history, definitely try and stay away from the two that are implicated with those. Expectations here is about staying well hydrated. Um, you don't want your patients to become dehydrated. They will urinate more at night. So if you have a falls risk patient, make sure they've got a clear line between them and the bathroom. Um, all those non-exciting discussions about keeping rugs out of the way and so forth, those are actually really important for the patient. Let you know if they have UTI or yeast infection system, symptoms. You can treat through it. You don't have to stop it. If it's a simple UTI, you just treat it, and most of them don't get another one. If they get recurrent ones, well, maybe this isn't the best drug for them. Um, hold these drugs when you get dehydrated or sick. So if your grandkid gives you a sickness and you're throwing up, vomiting, don't take the drug. Those are the people who sometimes precipitated that euglycemic DKA we talked about and report any GI illness to the provider. So this time, we're not just adjusting glycemics. We need to probably adjust blood pressure agents if folks are on a lot of blood pressure drugs or if they're already pretty close to goal. And then the testing, I get a lot of questions about this. When do I check creatinine? When do I check potassium? There's no hard guidelines that are written into the labels. But most of us will check a BMP at baseline after a couple of weeks of therapy or at their check-in visit to make sure they're doing OK. Know that creatinine can transiently increase. Um, oftentimes, it comes back to normal. It's not a reason to reduce the drug or stop the drug. We already talked about the DKA risk and the UTI. So that is all I have to say about the newest um, non-insulin agents. Okay, so we'll move on. Lastly, I have a little bit of information on the insulins. For those of you who like insulin or are using it, I do think you should know about what's available on the horizon. So here's a table of what we have available to us. Um, four flavors of insulin. So we have the rapid-acting ones, which are all those analogs listed there. We have the short-acting, which is just regular insulin. It's been around forever, human regular insulin. We have the intermediate acting insulin, which is just NPH, also been around forever, human NPH. And then long acting insulins, we have Detamir, Glargine, and now we have Degladec. So of all these things listed, Degladec's really the only new one for you guys in the last year or two. Why did I put some of these in bold face? If they're in bold face, it means they not only have their regular U100 form. Remember, all insulins are basically U100 insulins, meaning there's 100 units of insulin per cc of insulin. Um, but now we have U200 insulins uh, for Humalog. We have U300 insulins for Glargine. The newest insulin, Degladec, is available in a U100 and U200 form. We've had U500 insulin around forever. It used to just come in bottles. High-risk insulin, if you're going to prescribe it, because it's 500 units in one cc. Um, it's really complicated to explain how to do it in a U100 syringe, and most non-endocrinologists prefer not to do that. Um, it does come in a pen now. That's actually been a big deal for me in my practice because I use a good bit of U500. And then Basaglar or Glargine is the biosimilar insulin I was mentioning that is probably now available in some pharmacies. 
Um, it was the first, it's been around in other countries, but the US just approved it recently. It'll probably be about 25% cheaper, you know, at pocket cost than um, Lantus. Um, we'll just have to see how the costs play out. I don't know. But a lot of my formularies down in North Carolina, the state health plan there is now requiring, <laughs> Lantus is not going to be covered. It's all going to be Basaglar or one of the Novo insulins. So January 1st will be a lot of fun for all of us. As usual, As usual yeah, agreed. Um, this is the same data in a kind of just a pictorial form. So you have the shorter acting insulins on one side. Detamir doesn't last quite as long as Glargine. For those of you who use a lot of Detamir, I often end up using it BID, especially folks with type 1, folks who really need that 24-hour action profile, particularly when you're using under 20 units a day, you're not going to get to 24 hours. And then, of course, now we have Deglitic, and it just keeps going. My graph isn't big enough. Um, it keeps going for quite some time. So let's talk about Deglitic. Um, so like all the analog insulins, you're just manipulating amino acids to create a, quote, new insulin. Um, so here you have deletion of a threonine amino acid. You're adding a fatty acid to lysine. At the end of the day, you get a dihexamer. It's stable. And what's interesting is when you inject it, it forms into multihexamers. So you see that long, it's called a string of pearls. Apparently the people who do it think it's very pretty. Um, but in any case, that's what it looks like when it's injected. And then it dissociates over time into monomers. Monomers is what actually goes into the body and acts like insulin. So it has a very long duration of action, up to 42 hours, maybe more in some cases, and there's no peak. It's really flat. Um, it does not come in bottles at all. Okay? It only comes in pens. And that was a deliberate, I think, thing from the manufacturer because they have U100 and U200, and they don't want people to have to do dose conversions in your head or in your office. Um, efficacy is pretty similar. So, you know, there's no reason off the cuff to pick one versus the other. If you've got a strict formula indication, if a patient doing well on Glargine or Datamir, that's fine. Um, but do know that this drug has less intra-individual variability. I don't know how much you guys see this. You know, I use a lot of insulin in my patients, and I will tell you, especially at the higher doses of insulin, you can take 40, you can take 60, you can take 80, you can take 100. Sometimes you see that nice dose response, sometimes you don't. Patients will tell you, I take the same drug every day at the same time, I'm eating the same, my fasting blood sugars are different at different times of day, or different times of the week. This is not all patients, but there are some patients who suffer from this. In trials, Deglidec has less of that inter-individual variability. So you can see these nice area under the curves if you like that sort of thing. This is what I think is important, the third bullet. You get greater flexibility in the timing of each dose. So in these Deglidec trials, they did some really interesting, and I thought somewhat scary things, where they told folks, even with type 1, because a lot of type 1s were studied, um, to take insulin sometimes as close as 8 hours apart, your basal insulin, and sometimes maybe wait 36 hours to take your next dose. Um, and I thought, well, gee, it's going to stack up, and you're going to get more hypoglycemia, and this could be a real issue. And in fact, they didn't. So even when they were forced to take their insulin in a non-standardized, non-daily way, they did just as well. And in fact, sometimes they did better. Um, in the trials that are available, about 25% nocturnal hypoglycemia. See, I have a patient who's taken 30 units of Glargine or Detamir. Their mornings are high. You put them on 35, they start having some lows. You know, you're kind of doing this back and forth thing. This might be a good agent for you to consider for those folks, um, Deglidec. And then another practical issue is you can dial all the way up to 160 units um, of, of Deglidec if you're using the U200 pen. Currently with Glargine, Detamir, the most you can dial up is 80 units. So if you have folks on 100 units, they're splitting doses or doing multiple injections. So that's just a logistic issue. Cost is high. Um, it depends on what's covered by the formula. It may be the same copay. It may be higher. But the out-of-pocket cost is, is high. So not much in the terms of practicalities. If you, just, if you want to switch them from another basal, just use a one-to-one -one conversion. If it's a new start, you can use whatever you'd normally do for new starts. I think a lot of folks just start with 10 units of Glargine and go up. You can do that. There are some weight-based algorithms. Um, so you can start however you normally start your basal. The big difference is don't tell them to go up every day. You know, there's a lot of Glargine and Detamir algorithms out there that say that you can go a unit a day, two units every two days based on the fasting plasma glucose or fasting finger stick sugar. Wait at least three to four days because you know, it does take a longer time to reach that steady state. And also, you're going to look really silly if you prescribe you 200 pens and tell your patients to go up one unit at a time. Yeah, because you can't do that. It only comes in two unit increments. So you know, the window goes 2, 4, 6, 8, just something to be aware of. Um, there's nothing new here in terms of who might benefit. I've just kind of summarized for you what I said on the previous slide. But really, for me, I've been using it a lot in my shift workers, my folks who travel time zones, 
my people who fall asleep at night on their recliner and then they forgot their Lantus dose, they don't know if they should take it. So this tends to be something that's a little more forgiving. All right, so concentrated insulins are just those ones that are more concentrated than traditional U100. Even though they might seem like the same drug, you do get different pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So the more concentrated the insulin is, the longer it's gonna last. So 50 units of U100 versus 50 units of U300 of the same drug will have a slightly different profile and typically less variability. This again is just a summary of how these are available, pens versus vials or pens. The main advantage is less volume with about the same efficacy. That's basically it. So your high volume patients, they may want to do the math themselves to see if it's cheaper for them to pick up a couple of boxes of the more concentrated versus the less concentrated form. And you don't, as a provider, it's really easy. You don't have to convert the dose. You just tell them what to take and it dials up in less volume. Does anyone use the U500 at all? Well, I'm impressed. So, so U500 is approved for use in folks over 200 units of insulin a day. Um, and that's typically where we use it. It is really efficacious compared. So once you're using three, two, three, four, 600 units of insulin a day, using a concentrated insulin definitely gets you better efficacy. You get better A1C reduction. It's kind of complicated. Sometimes you have to get rid of the basal altogether and just use two or three times U500. That's what most of us do. Um, and it's now available in pens, which I think is great. So maybe it'll expand use to other folks if you have really insulin-resistant patients. So this, I think, is a really um, fun discussion. Basal insulin plus GLP-RA. I'm always looking for a way to streamline my patients' regimens because they're on a lot of things besides tough for diabetes, right? So metformin, um, basal insulin, GLP-RA, we use a lot of that at UNC, partly because we've done so many of the xenotide and the raglatide trials. We're just really comfortable with those drugs. Um, you get similar or greater efficacy compared to if you started to add on bolus, so you know your humologs, novologs, glulysine. You are going to get obviously less weight gain, less hypoglycemia with the basal insulin versus adding on prandial insulin. Of course, you're going to get more GI side effects because that's what GLPs can do. And so this has to be updated to who? Because I submitted these slides in mid-November and November 21st. Two agents were approved um, that were combo GLP-1 and basal insulin, so they are approved now. Idegliera is Degladec and Liraglutide, um, and that I think is going by the brand name of Zoltofi. You have to don't quote me on that. Um, Glargine and Lixazenatide has also been approved on the exact same day, maybe for dramatic effect. Um, but in any case, it's known as Soliqua, and they're fixed combinations, and you can just kind of keep titrating up. The maximum basal insulin doses in these drugs is not high. It's like 50 to 60 units. So if you have someone who needs 150 units of insulin a day, probably don't need this fixed combination. Um, but you can kind of just move on up from a couple of units of insulin. The starting dose, I think, is like 10 units for some of these drugs. So they work similarly or greater than using just basal insulin alone or either one of the components alone, or even better than basal bolus. You're going to get less nausea, hyperglycemia and weight gain. And some might say, well, why don't I just prescribe two drugs separately? And to be honest, I'm kind of someone who likes to add on one at a time, even though that's not been the push with diabetes drugs, so I like to know what's causing the side effect. But the idea is if you're using sub-maximal doses of two drugs, you're going to maximize the efficacy and minimize the side effects. Um, and those are what I'll call for now potential adv advantages because I don't have good clinical trial data to show you. Um, pricing will be interesting because I'm guessing the price will be very high for these drugs. Yeah. Will it be as high as taking those two drugs separately and getting two copays? I don't know. So we'll have to see. All right. So take a deep breath. You got through the world of diabetes drugs today. This is that same algorithm I showed you at the beginning. I just want to revisit it and highlight a couple of things. All right, so our older drugs are good for efficacy. They're good for cost. Um, but they're not good for hypoglycemia and weight gain. Our newer drugs are good for um, hypoglycemia and weight loss. Not good for the wallet, unfortunately, um, particularly for uninsured patients. DPP-4s have a little bit of a hash la line because they don't actually cause weight loss. And then I took the liberty of adding some hearts on there because we are going to have to start thinking, especially those of us who take care of older patients who are getting diabetes as an older patient with all sorts of comorbidities, yes, we care about your eyes, your kidneys, and your nerves, but that is not the main thing we care about in these folks, these metabolic syndrome folks, older folks. It's CV risk. So you know, my cardiology colleagues are actually really excited about starting um, empagliflozin or liraglutide right now, and more drugs will be coming down the pipeline. I take care of a lot of young diabetics, type 1, so I'm all about the A1C still. You know, I care about the long-term microvascular complications, so you may have to weigh that in your individual patient. 
Um, this combination no longer has a question mark. It has been studied, and there's now a trial out from in the Lancet that I mentioned to you a couple of um, weeks ago. Um, you can use those two drugs safely, the SGL2s and GLP receptor agonists. You get more benefit in terms of A1C. Again, not additive or synergistic, but about another half percentage point than you would have gotten of just using each one of those by themselves. But you know, potentially, and you get a little more weight gain. Um, again, not synergistic, but almost additive weight, I mean, weight loss. You get almost additive weight loss. So for the person who's really heavy and needs to lose weight and doesn't want hypoglycemia and has a good formulary plan, I don't think this is a bad option to go for. And then if you're getting into complex regimens, again, think about ways you can add something else to basal insulin besides prandial. So that is it. I'm not going to read all my summary points. They say essentially what I said before, but you can certainly read through them for a summary. Um, and I always tell folks at the end of one of these talks, you know, it's really overwhelming. You don't want to feel like you're doing the wrong thing for your patient, and you probably aren't. You're probably doing the right thing. If you're listening to them, starting metformin, listening to their preferences, we're moving much more into a patient-centered approach for diabetes, which is really important. This is a long-term treatment. So whatever works for your patient doesn't cause them side effects that they will comply with, um, you're probably doing a good job. <laughs>